will be speaking us to us today about adult management of hypophosphatasia. Dr. Dahir is an endocrinologist and a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University. Uh, she did her undergraduate at University of Virginia and medical school at Univer University of Eastern Virginia Medical School. And she did her postgraduate training at Vanderbilt in internal medicine and endocrinology. Dr. Dahir has done a, a lot of extensive research in adult hypophosphatasia, and she is one of my go-to people when I have questions about, uh, about patients with hypophosphatasia. So she is a, a true wealth of knowledge, and I am uh, very grateful that she's joining us today. Dr. Dahir. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that just fine? Okay, great. Well, first of all, um, thank you so much, Michael and Laura and Eric and uh, Charlene for inviting me to give this talk today. And I'm absolutely honored to do it. I think this, this is an incredible um, program. So thank you for letting me uh, be a part of it. And yes, I'm focusing on adult hypophosphatasia or HPP today. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, here are my disclosures. And uh, our learning objectives today, this is gonna really be a whirlwind. Uh, I could probably talk for 10 solid hours on adult HPP and we have about 30 minutes for the lecture part. So this is meant to be a 30,000 foot flyover and I'm gonna hit the highlights and hopefully what I'm gonna do is uh, stimulate some good questions for everybody at the end. So um, brief overview of the genetics and epidemiology. We'll talk about signs and symptoms. I'm gonna fo focus a lot on diagnostic methods because I, I think making the clinical diagnosis of HPP can be a little bit tricky since there's such a wide spectrum of disease. Um, we'll briefly talk um, about management and then we'll talk about um, real world clinical cases because everyone's different. Okay, uh, define genetics and epidemiology. And, um, you know, th this is a nice st starting point, this slide, uh, which really highlights the prevalence of autosomal recessive, which is an incredibly rare disease. And it's different geographically. Um, just, you know, for example, when we think about autosomal recessive rare HPP, it's about one in 100,000 in Canada to as rare as one in 900,000 in Japan. And um, there's differences based upon founder mutations, but for autosomal dominant, it's obviously, uh, it's a lot more common. And if you look at the literature, there was a nice paper in 2011 in France that estimated autosomal dominant HPP to be as common as maybe one in 6,000. We have um, a variant database at Vanderbilt where we have um, ALPL gene mutations are included in that. And um, to be a heterozygote for a pathogenic mutation is about seven in 1,000. So a, a lot more common. But again, that's just thinking about the variant and does having a variant mean you have the disease? So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's certainly out there. Okay, um, just basics of the pathophysiology of HPP. Um, we start with uh, mutation in ALPL, which is a gene on chromosome one. Uh, this codes for tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. And we end up with low tissue nonspecific alkalase activity. And this is a cell surface enzyme that uh, it's ubiquitous, but it has a lot of activity in the bone and in the liver and in our CNS but it's a dephosphorylator. So it's, it's an enzyme that sits on the cell surface and dephosphorylates or takes a phosphate group off of other proteins. Um, the significance of this in bone particularly is the dephosphorylation of pyrophosphate, which is an inhibitor of bone mineralization. So if we're not able to inhibit the inhibitor of bone mineralization, we have lots of downstream consequences from that. We, we are not able to put calcium, phosphorus, other minerals into bone. We get osteomalacia and we get uh, accumulation of pyrophosphate extraskeletally. Um, tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase is also important for dephosphorylating pyridoxal 5' phosphate. Um, and another uh, substrate that we'll talk about later in this talk is uh, phosphoethanolamine. So we get dysregulation of that due to low alphos. Um, oh, sorry guys. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that little glitch. All right, a little bit more about the, uh, the ALPL gene. I, I mentioned this is on the short uh, arm of chromosome one. It's got 12 exons. 
Um, we have distributions of variants across all exons, uh, although uh, variants in exon one don't tend to have as much clinical significance. But um, there are over 400 reported different variants that are associated with pathogenicity. Um, I, I always love to point out the beautiful work of Etienne Mornay, who curates this database. It is incredibly helpful. It's a, it's a moving target. So every time that you look, there are more uh, genes that are listed there. And in addition to just um, having a curated list of genes, we also now have whether or not there's a dominant negative effect associated with that. We have functional studies, enzyme activity. It's just, it's a wealth of knowledge and very, very helpful in, in putting these uh, gene mutations into um, clinical contexts. Okay, so where it all started. So I'm not talking about pediatric or infantile HPP, but I love to put this slide up because I think it's really illustrative of where we were a decade ago and, and where I was a decade ago when I was just discovering HPP in the literature and in my patients. And, and this is one of the, the landmark articles by Michael White in 2012 of the infantile study. And, and just, you know, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. We, we see the, the physiologic consequences of infantile or perinatal HPP. And when we look at this baby, we, we see that she's on oxygen um, and that's due to inefficient formation or, or mineralization of the rib cage. So there's respiratory compromise. We see the radiographic uh, the radiographs here where we have evidence of, of rickets and skeletal deformities. When we're not able to repurpose phosphorus off of PPI, that it builds up in the blood and we get these metabolic consequences of hyperphosphatemia, hypercalcemia, uh, and that can lead to renal failure. And in fact, a diagnosis of infantile HPP was tantamount to a death sentence. So uh, when patients were, were diagnosed perinatally, it was, mortality was nearly 100%. For infantile, you know, 75% mortality at five years. It's just a really, really, really terrible disease. And that's, that's really where we were in the understanding in the literature um, and for most of us taking care of patients about a decade ago. So when we fast forward 10 years from now or to 2021, where are we in our understanding? Our understanding of different forms of hypophosphatasia have really exploded. And um, this is a pedigree uh, of a paper that I published along with um, Cheryl uh, Greenberg and Priya Kishnani last year. And, and I, I think there are lots of teaching points from this pedigree. So when we look at generation five, this is an example of perinatal HPP of a baby that came to our institution and died at day one of hypoplastic lungs. Um, and so very characteristic of, of what we thought the disease was about a decade ago. What happened in this particular case is the family was seen by genetics and genetic counselors and there was testing that was done and both parents carried one um, gene mutation and were told that they were carriers and they didn't have to worry about having a disease. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the grandmother was a patient of mine who had been referred uh, for osteoporosis and had actually already been on bisphosphonates. And by the time that I had seen her, she had metatarsal fractures and spine fractures and, and a femur fracture. And so lots of teaching points in this family and also in our evolution of understanding of the disease, because we can see different examples of autosomal recessive of, are these patients uh, carry, are the parents carriers? Are they, um, will they have emerging autosomal dominant HPP. And then also as you go up the generations, you can see this progressive burden of disease development over time. So it's a, it's a really evolving disease, not only in, an, in our understanding, but as we go up the generations and as patients age. Okay, clinical signs and symptoms. A little bit about the classification. The classification, of course, is important when we're interpreting the literature. Um, sometimes I wonder, does this help us uh, to keep it straight or does it hurt us? Um, 
because we need to know that there's a wide spectrum of disease. There's lots of overlap and the phenotype changes over time. But the, the classic classification, we actually can start with perinatal benign, which is a radiographic diagnosis where they look like they have HPP, but then when they're born, they do really well. And um, most of these are heterozygotes of maternal origin, and you know they may develop in more of an autosomal dominant picture later on. We have our perinatal and our infantile, which I've already described. Juvenile is diagnosis after six months and before 18. So a huge, that's where we start to get a big spectrum of um, difference in disease burden. Then we have this kind of arbitrary diagnosis after, after age 18, which I think sometimes limits us in our, in our understanding and our ability to treat patients. And then the final category here, odontohypophosphatasia, where the disease is limited to early loss of primary and secondary dentition. And also these are patients you kind of have to watch out for because they may develop additional uh, disease symptomatology over time. Alrighty, so more uh, about what we can see in adults. Um, and we've talked about the skeletal consequences, the, the fracture, osteomalacia and fractures, the, the ones that are very classic in the literature, but also classic of what we see when patients come to see us in the office, the metatarsal fractures uh, in the feet that can be really poorly healing our pseudo fractures, our, our subtrochanteric atypical uh, fractures. These are um, very uh, characteristic of HPP. And in addition to that, there's, there's kind of a, an overlapping phenotype of muscle problems and weakness where patients can have a hard time with stiffness and getting up from being seated to standing. Um, and inability to walk for long distances and overall fatigue. And, and I think it's, a, it's really interesting to ponder about what causes, what, what are the causes of those symptoms? And, you know, is, is it pyrophosphate deposition in the muscle that we're not able to determine by biopsy? Is it downstream dysregulation of oxidative phosphorylation? I think there's lots of interesting questions about how A gets to be there. Um, but then again, we talked earlier with the, in, with the infants about metabolic derangements, high calcium, high phosphorus. We end up in adults the same. Usually it's more high phosphorus than calcium, but we get calcifications of tendons and ligaments at the insertion site. And that, that en enthesopathy and calcification can really worsen that kind of stiffness and pain. Physical function, we talked about that, and I'll show you some slides uh, that give you a little bit more of what's in the medical literature about, um, about physical function deficits, the teeth, Teeth are important. Alkaline phosphatase has similar function in odontoblasts. So if we have deficient alkaline phosphatase, we're not able to make cementum and keep that periodontal ligament in place. And then, you know, downstream consequences of mineral abnormalities, which may lead to kidney stones uh, and calcifications. Okay. Now, the next three slides I'll go through really quick. This is the HIPS and HOST survey. And, and again, these are surveys. So obviously there's a little bit of bias that goes into this depending on who has access and who, who responds to these. But I, I think that these are illustrative of what, of what we see in, in clinic, which is why I hang on to these slides. So fractures, what type of fractures do we see in HPP? Well, we see a lot. So in this one, particular survey, 86% um, had a lifetime history of fractures. So that's way more than the, the general population, most of them requiring surgery. And then a little bit more granular detail of the type of surgery, fracture fixation with plates, rods, and external fixators. And uh, I'm hoping Dr. Tosi may comment on um, you know, the, the difference between using a rod, which we would probably want to use for somebody with osteomalacia rather than using a plate and screws, which might, you know, might make it a little bit worse um, if we need to have load uh, bearing versus load sharing. Um, so I think there are some teaching points in there. Okay, so outside of fractures, pain and impaired mobility. So this is a huge amount of pain, pain requ requiring 
prescription pain medicine and the use of assisted walk devices. So 60% of adults requiring some type of assistance to walk. So you can just imagine how that's gonna affect quality of life, ability to take care of your family, ability um, to work, even 22% in a wheelchair there. Um, and then more about physical function, just getting around. So this is a little bit reflective of um, both um, uh, upper body um, need for occupational therapy, lower body need for physical therapy. So difficulty up and down stairs, sitting to standing and picking objects up off the floor. Um, just a, a little bit of a newer publication. It's, it's more patients. This is um, the first publication from the HPP registry. So this, this is over 300 adults, so patients greater than 18, um, which really validates uh, a lot of what was in the HIPS and HOST. And I don't have all the figures in here, I, I apologize, but a couple of really nice um, points here is um, looking at pain. So lots of patients with pain, much more than the normal population and not that much difference based on classification of diagnosis. So it doesn't really matter if you're diagnosed pre or post uh, age of 18. Lots of patients requiring assistive devices um, for uh, mobility and getting around. So, and, and the, it, what's interesting is in the adult population, which we tend to think is less severe as those with an earlier onset actually used wheelchairs, crutches and handrails more. Um, and then looking at quality of life. And, and so this study looks at uh, used both the hack and the SF36. So, you know, much lesser of a quality of life in multiple um, domains as compared to the general population. So a lot of um, morbidity associated with this this disease, you know, I, I, and a lot of talks, uh, you know, I talk about the difference between having infantile HPP and having adult HPP where infantile HPP, you can almost think of it as a death sentence, but adult HPP, I really think of it as a life sentence because there's a lot of pain and suffering associated with this. Okay. So that, those are the signs and symptoms. And I definitely want to spend some time on making an, a, a, an appropriate diagnosis and using clinical context and using all of the tools that you have. This is not really an easy di a disease to diagnose in grownups because it's complicated and um, there's a wide spectrum of disease. And so I'm, I hope the argument that I'm making today is we need lots of tools and to use these tools in aggregate um, to give a clinical diagnosis of HPP. So just a little bit about biochemistry, genetic testing, imaging, and functional assessment. Okay, so um, I, I think everybody knows this. Most of us as endocrinologists, rheumatologists, orthopedic surgeons, geneticists, oftentimes when we diagnose somebody with HPP as an adult, They've been languishing in, in somebody else's clinic for a long, long time before uh, low alkaline phosphatase is noted. And there's lots of cross phenotypic crossover with other skeletal displays, just like OI or XLH, and then just lots of um, pain and fibromyalgia and other rheumatologic diseases. So sometimes you have to go looking for them. Um, Alkphos, again, I think a persistently low alkaline phosphatase is important for the diagnosis, but we need other biomarkers um, in addition. So I, I, I think most reference ranges have caught up to give age appropriate and gender um, appropriate reference ranges. But what I have over here in the bottom right is, is our histograms that I've made from the um, Vanderbilt um, chemistry lab. And this is when we take all of our alkaline phosphatase levels and create a histogram with two standard deviations above and below normal. And what I did is I, I took the our available alkaline phosphatase from those that we have biobanked with ALPL um, gene mutations and compared them to those without. And what you can see is there's, there's lots of crossover. Um, so our folks with pathogenic mutations sometimes have normal alkphos and our folks that are healthy sometimes have low alkphos. 
And so there's a humongous differential diagnosis. And probably a lot of you on this call get referred patients for possible HPP for an isolated low alkaline phosphate, even maybe a persistent low alkaline phosphatase, but it must be some, might, maybe something else. If we, we don't have anything else to make us think that they may have HPP. And so I'm not going through all of these, but there are other inherited genes associated with low alkaline phosphatase. There's lots of metabolic um, issues or vitamin deficiencies, and there are even uh, lab artifacts which can co cause low alkphos. So a lot of times you have a lot of homework to do to rule these other things out. Um, other biomarkers, I think it's really helpful to have lots of supporting information if you're unsure of a definitive diagnosis. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, phospho, urinary phosphoethanol. I mean, we, we use it a lot at Vanderbilt. This is from um, a poster presentation from last year, um, comparing patients that um, were referred for possible HPP, were we able to adjudicate that or not, and then uh, retrospectively looked at their um, phosphoethanolamine levels that we were blinded to. And, and so I, I think it's very helpful as supplementary information um, and maybe underutilized, maybe we should be using this more, but I think, I think there's more work to do uh, with phosphoethanolamine. B6, obviously um, this is well reported in the literature that we get extra cellular accumulation of PLP because we can't dephosphorylate it and take it into cells. Um, and so we, we usually think of a, an elevated PLP and there are caveats to that. So um, if you take a supplement, uh, you can have a high B6 level. It, there, there's B6 that are, that's hidden in all sorts of sports drinks and nutritional supplements. So you always have to make sure that someone's been off of that for a couple of weeks. And then Michael White just published uh, a beautiful paper um, and Michael White and colleagues. And it was um, a, a mother or child with normal B6 levels due to B6 deficiency. So I think having a low level might not lose, might, might not rule it out. But if you have three surrogate markers, your ALKFOS, your PEA, and your B6, and they're all moving in the right direction, I think that's just nice additional supporting information. So genetic results. Um, I, I'm a big believer that this is very helpful um, in adjudicating the disease. Um, you know, most of the time we're able to find a, a gene mutation, which is um, usually a missense mutation. Um, then, you know, next deletions or duplications. There, you know, there are a small amount of patients that were not able to find um, a gene, uh, a pathogenic gene, but it's very, very helpful if it comes back and we have the appropriate clinical context. So, so um, you know, if any of you are geneticists, uh, you know, please um, go kind on me uh, if I don't explain this well, but, you know, pathogenic, um, a pathogenic mutation is, it's a variant that's already been well established um, with disease and databases and um, in, in the literature. Um, and so, and it's rare, it's novel and it's rare and it segregates um, with disease. So, so that's great supporting information. The likely pathogenic, um, you know, very similar, it's novel, it's, it's rare. We have computer in silico models that give us a good hypothesis about how it may be um, uh, disease causing. Then we go down this slippery slope of variants of uncertain clinical significance, which can be confusing for patients, confusing um, for physicians. And that's when there's insufficient um, clinical um, evidence, so, or insufficient or conflicting. And that's when we need lots of other clinical context to help us uh, to know uh, what to do there or either phone a friend of your uh, local geneticist to help you with that one. Um, okay, so how good are we with predicting phenotype on only a gene mutation? And, and I hope this um, is illustrative of, of the fact that not the answer is not very. Um, without other clinical um, information. And this is from one of our student projects um, from a couple of years ago where we had two, uh, we looked at two different um, ALPL variants that we have in our um, 
I view our gene database and we took one that was associated with pathogenicity and another one that wasn't. And we did computer modeling to generate a hypothesis of why that might be. And so our pathogenic mutation is in an active site. Um, so we can, it makes sense that this might um, cause disease. We're, we're changing um, a negatively charged aspartate by neutral alanine. So that, that might uh, contribute to pathogenicity. Our, our other variant is not really anywhere where we think that there might be a clinical um, effect. But then what we did is we have a de-identified database where we can curate the patients with these particular gene mutations and with our pathogenic gene, you know, 30% of patients had um, some, some, you know, features of a skeletal and dental abnormality. So a lot didn't. And then for the one, um, the, the, the more benign variant was, you know, there were actually about 25% of patients with skeletal and dental disease. So I think my only point with this is, is that we, you really need to put all of your tools together in aggregate. Okay, so now we say now we feel really confident that you have a patient with HPP and you need to do functional testing. So you know they have the disease, and your question is: is what? How am I going to treat them? Do they need treatment? When do they need treatment? And how do I measure? How do I measure that? And I, this is the pediatric slide. So these are these are all of the tools that we have for assessment, and so. Um, we, you know, rickets, this is something that's very obvious to see with our radiographic global impression of, of change by bone density. Do they require uh, ventilatory assist assistance? And then we have all of these um, tools for developmental milestones and phys physical function. So it's, it's easy, easier, I should say, to come up in your mind of what are the deficits and what are my goals of treatment? Um, but when we think about what we have for adults, it's, it's trickier, it's, it's harder, um, especially if we look back on the adult uh, HPP clinical trial, where we're either looking at change in surrogate markers or the ability to do a six minute walk test. Um, and so, you know, at least this is a starting point of a six minute walk, walk test to get a handle on what's the functional decline in patients, because personally it's, it's, it's nice to document what the deficit is so you have a, a goal of treatment and, and the six minute walk test is, is one of the, the, the bigger um, tests that we use for adult HPP. So I think we're getting better um, at how we do baseline assessment and come up with our metrics for how patients are progressing. Are they getting better? Are they staying the same? Are they getting worse? Do we need to think about initiation of therapy? Is therapy even working? Um, and so in addition to the six minute walk test, um, the timed up and go um, has now been looked at uh, in, in a small adult HPP study. The lower extremity function scale, and that, that's, um, that's an assessment uh, tool that's helpful for physical therapy. The SF36 for, for quality of life um, is very helpful. Um, and so, so these are the things that, that we can use as our tools about thinking about whether or not we're gonna treat somebody. Um, and I'm probably running out of time. So supportive care and enzyme replacement therapy, you know, how and when do we treat adult patients with HPP? Um, and I like to put this slide up because it's a really, really busy slide and your, your eye sort of doesn't even know where to go when you're looking at this. And I think the take home point is um, it's complicated and um, there's lots of systems that are affected and HPP and it takes a village. Um, and so it's a little hard and a little daunting um, to think about how to manage somebody who's so complex. Um, and I'll tell you, it's very helpful to have somebody helping to coordinate all the different needs of these patients because it's, it's genetics, it's endocrine, it's orthopedics, it's physical therapy. Um, and how does one do that without a care coordinator? Um, and also just to think about what's the infrastructure at your institution to help you to take care of somebody with lots, lots of special physical needs. And so hopefully we'll get some questions on that as well.
Okay, so um, enzyme replacement therapy. Um, do we need to go straight from zero to 60? What are the other options that we might consider for an adult with HPP? And there are lots of case reports in the literature about using these parathyroid analogs um, to help. And, um, you know, just the take home point here is that we would consider this to be effective in someone who has one normal allele, you have to have uh, the ability to make some wild type of alkaline phosphatase for one to expect that using a PTH drug might work. Certainly, um, you know, case, like I said, case reports that are out there, um, it's, it's uh, certainly something to that you you might be able to consider. Um, a small um, paper, um, Lothar Seafried uh, from Germany um, used uh, BPS-804, which um, is Cetruzumab, which is at least it's not FDA approved here in the US, but a small um, study that showed improvements in, in bone turnover markers and BMD. So is this a potential therapy down, down the road? Um, I thought a very pr provocative paper um, recently um, looking at using bisphosphonates in two adults that had hypophosphatasia but did not have osteomalacia on bone biopsy. This is something that could be safe to use where we thought they might have a component of both HPP and osteoporosis. So that's that's an, an interesting um, thing to talk about. Um, my only um, comment on that is, you know, you, we probably need to follow patients for a long, long time before, um, you know, to see how their disease develops over time before having real comfort doing that. Um, and then what do we think about um, enzyme replacement therapy and, and what's, what's in the literature and what's available for patients that are really in need? Um, and over on the left, we, we see our, um, we are our molecule, which is such an interesting drug in that we have the recombinant alkaline phosphatase, which is tethered to 10 aspartate molecules, which changes the charge and makes a, an, an electromagnetic attraction. And that's how we, we tether um, the, the drug to bone um, and get it attached to the cells to, to do its thing. Um, here is a really, really simple slide of the enzyme replacement therapy portfolio. And I'm not gonna go through all of this uh, today, um, but the bottom, um, the bottom right is the 009 study, which is the adult study. And uh, so this is challenging for, for physicians that may have more patients with adult HPP that were actually enrolled in the study. Um, so this, this is 13 patients. Um, and the primary endpoints, again, we don't have the luxury of looking at rickets or ventilatory support or, or developmental milestones. This was looking at surrogate markers, so the pyrophosphate and um, the PLP, um, as well as the six-minute walk test, um, plus some other, other measures. And um, so, you know, there was a, a, a statistically significant change in PLP as a surrogate marker, so we have that to go by an improvement uh, in the six minute walk test uh, by six months, which was sustained um, over, over a year. And, and that was even with not being able to include patients that were non-ambulatory or using significant um, assistive walk devices. Um, and so that's so, you know, anytime any of us or anybody on any drug, it's really important to talk about the risk benefit and also what data that we have available. And so I do spend a lot of time with, with new extrinsic starts going over the small amount of, of data that's there, but hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be more. Okay, so what's the evidence to start enzyme replacement therapy with no guidelines? It's, it's really funny with HPP, I feel like we're working backwards a little um, in that we, we have a treatment for, for a disease before we really understand the disease. Um, you know, when, when, when I started, we talked about what, what was the landscape of our understanding of the disease a decade ago? What was the therapeutic landscape at that time? And so now, you know, we have a, we have a treatment um, that might be great for the milder forms, but when do we start? How do we start? 
and how long do we treat? I, I think a lot of these things are, are up for discussion. So when, when I go through this, I, I do try and think very carefully about the data that was in the, the 009 study. Um, you know, I don't do a bone biopsy on all patients because there's risk that's associated with that. But osteomalacia, obviously proven by bone biopsy is very important. And then just thinking about um, what, what are their physical deficits? Can they walk? Can they get up from a chair? What's their quality of life? What's their pain? And I think a lot of this is just having an, an honest discussion about risks and benefits for the patient. Okay, um, I think this is my last uh, slide. And and uh, I put this up, um, hopefully to stimulate some discussion points because these are things that we struggle with in real life. And it's, you know, how do we get access of therapy to patients that really need it uh, for a drug that's very expensive um, and not many people feel comfortable prescribing it and lots of patients uh, feel they would benefit from it. And so some of the issues that, that we struggle with here at Vanderbilt the un and underinsured people that live in remote areas and have no access to specialists. So for someone that's non-ambulatory, it's not easy to come to a tertiary medical center. So, so how do we reach them? Do patients have the correct diagnosis? How do we get hung up by the classification of pediatric onset versus adult onset? Because if you live in the US, it's not FDA approved. For someone who has disease symptomatology that start after the age of 18, what do we do if we have a variant of undetermined significance? Or what if we don't have positive genetic tests, but everything else lines up where it looks like the patient has HPP? What do we do about cost? Um, you know, we get it covered, but the patient has a copay every month that's $50,000. What do we do about that? What if we really are very passionate about taking care of these patients, but we don't have the institutional infrastructure to get them to all their other subspecialists? What do we do with the patients that, that are doing better on the medicine, but they have really bad side effects like injection site uh, reactions? And how do, we, how do we manage expectations of, you know, we know that this, this medicine might help you get up out of a chair and walk, but is it gonna fix everything else? Um, so these are questions that, that you know, uh, Eric and I talk about um, all the time. Um, and so I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to give this talk. And um, we'll move on to questions next. Thanks tremendously. Wow. Uh, that was a great presentation and so much information. We'll take a quick break at this point.